It brings wild lightning that threatens life and property. Flash floods that turn a dry wash into a raging torrent. And blinding dust storms that stretch across the entire valley. The storms are coming. It's just a matter of time. This is Monsoon Watch 360. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, we'll talk about the dangers of the monsoon from lightning and flash flooding to microbursts. But we're also going to talk about the preparations you can make to keep your family safe. First up, how Mother Nature cooks up the monsoon. Every year, the cycle repeats. After the mountain snow has disappeared and the winter rains seem a distant memory, the sun rapidly heats the land with daytime temperatures surpassing 100 degrees. Almost magically, the monsoon bubbles to life. It heralds the arrival of moisture from faraway oceans. Soon, rain will be refreshing the landscape. Already a strong high pressure system is building east of Arizona. The clockwise rotation brings moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of California. This overall circulation only lasts about three months. The Arizona monsoon starts on June 15th and lasts until the end of September. Early on, we see a lot of dust storms. The rains usually hold off until early July. The valley gets about a third of its annual rainfall from the monsoon, while Tucson and Alpine get half their yearly precipitation. In parts of northern Mexico, the monsoon accounts for 70% of the annual rain. So you'd think something as large scale and powerful as the North American monsoon would be dependable, but that's not really the case. Rainfall totals fluctuate wildly year to year and even from neighborhood to neighborhood. The last 10 years shows the ups and downs of the monsoon in the valley. In 2008, we received more than five and a half inches of rain, but in 2007 and 2009, less than an inch each year. It's the unpredictable nature of the monsoon and the severe nature of some of the storms that keeps meteorologists on alert all summer long for even the smallest changes in the atmosphere. One of the big concerns during our monsoon season is dust storms, and when it comes to dust, we keep our eyes to the south. Here's why. Thunderstorms over the desert south of the valley often pick up dust and push it toward the valley. And with the soil being especially parched this year, the 500 foot wall, there's a good chance we'll see more of those walls of dust. The valley averages about 9 to 12 dust storms each summer. Those storms can impact the entire valley, but the most susceptible spots include communities in the southeast valley like Chandler, Gilbert, and Tempe. The I-10 can become a danger zone, along with the 60 and the 202, especially during that evening commute. This monsoon season, in addition to radar and storm spotters, we've got a brand new HD camera in Chandler to help us keep an eye on the skies to the south and give the East Valley an earlier heads up on what's blowing your way. I'm just west of the New Mexico border along Interstate 10 in an area historically notorious for dust storms and the deadly crashes they cause. The Arizona Department of Transportation has picked this spot along with two others along a 20 mile stretch to install this device as an experiment to warn drivers of dangerous conditions. Could this dust storm sensor have helped save the life of Lenny Lubers? He was the love of my life. He and two others died back on October 29th of 2013 when a dust storm on I-10 near Picacho Peak boom, 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 boom. set off a 19 vehicle chain reaction crash. Lubers' girlfriend, Lucia Labadia, got the news as word spread from family. I remember going to the hospital. I remember trying to find out. If you're still alive. Luber's sister, Jessica Vargas, was behind the wheel that afternoon as the two drove back from Tucson to the valley. Did you see any warning signs, any billboards or anything that day? No. These crashes are, are heartbreaking because we've seen them over the years and we know how many people are involved, how many vehicles wind up being involved, and it's mayhem. That's why Adon spokesman Doug Ninsel says the agency was granted $600,000 to set up an experiment with three of these dust storm sensors. They measure wind speed, direction, and visibility. They also have cameras. High winds or low visibility that's detected will trigger overhead message boards behind the sensor to send out a warning to drivers. Hazard beacons will flash, a radio system will activate, and email alerts will go out to ADOT workers and the Department of Public Safety. But Ninsel says they've run into a few problems with the system. We really want to be confident in the system, knowing that it can do what it's supposed to do, 
uh, before we, we launch into some other area. Another caveat, the high price tag. For the price of maybe one much more expensive system, you, you could possibly get 50 or 100 of these uh, put together. Ken Waters, warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Phoenix, has developed another option. But on the cheap. The self-proclaimed hobbyist spent the last two years toiling with a series of electronic parts. He ended up with a device that not only measures winds, temperature, humidity, and light. This is really pretty useful. But also visibility. How? It detects the quality of the air by measuring particulate matter. He tested it for the first time last summer. And I caught two of the big dust storms that we had in the East Valley, and the results were remarkable. The sensor takes readings every 30 seconds, and with the help of the internet, Waters can see any spike of dust from his computer. Link a bunch of these $120 sensors in dust-prone areas, and Waters says you've got a network that can send out alerts to emergency responders, meteorologists, and drivers. The whole key here is to try to save lives. We really do think that technology holds a lot of promise. While both devices still need experimentation and development, Luber's friends and family say it's a step in the right direction. And hopefully that his death was not in vain, that somebody else doesn't lose someone that they love for a $120 fix. The very thing that carries haboobs like this across the desert are outflow boundaries. And although we've known about them for years, it hasn't been until very recently that we've been able to track them. We will typically see a very small, fine line of light radar return. We'll actually see moving out away from the main rain area of the thunderstorm. Uh, along with that, with the Doppler radar, we can of course look at velocities as well and get a feel for what the, uh, the speeds might be. That's important because outflow boundaries, as seen on these radar screens come together, new thunderstorms can form rapidly. Those gust fronts will actually act like a little miniature cold front, almost like a little wedge moving into that, that warmer air in the lower elevations, forcing that air to rise, kind of like a, a snow plow moving along almost, and can actually serve to initiate new thunderstorms. But make no mistake, gust fronts coming together aren't a guarantee that we'll get rain. The start of monsoon season is often marked by dry thunderstorms, lightning and wind with little or no rain. That kind of weather can be very dangerous when it comes to wildfires. And with the dry winter and spring that we've had, could be looking at big trouble this summer. It was a summer of devastation Arizonans will never forget. 19 lives lost to a wildfire. We're devastated. We just lost 19 of some of the finest people you'll ever meet. In the hills outside Yarnell, firefighters were up against flames that switched direction when winds from a nearby thunderstorm roared through. Okay, I'm here with Mountain Hot Shot. Your escape route has been cut off. They were trapped and overrun by flames, proving once again that fighting fire during the monsoon is unpredictable and dangerous. Those outflow winds uh, from the thunderstorms are the most critical winds to firefighters. As an instant meteorologist with the National Weather Service, Valerie Myers keeps an eye on the weather for fire crews. I'm watching the radar and I'm doing everything that I can to get the message to the firefighters. But there's something else she's watching, a correlation she's noticed between extreme heat and deadly fires. When we we can see extreme heat. Well, I'm talking about when we're looking at records being broken, not just above and beyond your normal. It's hot summer day when we get up to like maybe 110. When we start getting into the 115 to that 120 degree range, it's a very, very strong rarefied atmosphere. When the mercury climbs past 115, she says what we know about fire behavior goes out the window. Things are just ready to burn very rapidly, very aggressively and fire behavior can be very unpredictable. June 29, 2013, Phoenix got to 119 degrees. Our fourth hottest day on record was within 36 hours of the Yarnell tragedy. Our hottest day ever in the valley, 122 degrees in June of 1990. The same day, six firefighters were killed fighting the Dude Fire near Payson. Looks like the surface of the moon up there. It's pretty bad. Witnesses say a 30-foot wall of flames raced through the forest in one of the most unusual examples of fire behavior they'd ever seen. Myers thinks that's no coincidence and we should learn from these tragedies by expecting the unexpected when it comes to fires on unusually hot days. Just have a heads up for that day. If it can be extreme fire behavior. You, it's really unpredictable. You have no clue really what's going to happen that day. With the onset of the summer rains, the fire season quickly comes to an end. But with the start of thunderstorms comes another threat, 
from microbursts. When microbursts hit, severe damage can follow. But downbursts are pretty common. The microbursts that are causing really major damage are the ones that are extremely rare, uh, fortunately for us. That's Randy Servany, a meteorologist at Arizona State University. He says downbursts occur at the end of every thunderstorm. When a storm is first developing, you're getting primarily uplift. So it's lifting it up, it's creating the clouds, creating that monster uh, anvil that you see at the top of it and such. But then as the precipitation starts to fall out of it, it's gonna force the air to go down. Oddly, Servany says, it's the smallest downbursts in size, the microbursts as we call them, that we really have to worry about. When it's a really localized, extensive blast of air, an air bomb, if you will, that sinks and blows up near the ground, that's called a microburst. And that's where we can get some winds that are going on the surface, maybe in excess of 100 miles an hour. And since microbursts are localized events, it makes them virtually invisible to radar at times. These events that are called microbursts are sh so short lasting that they can uh, quickly appear in one place, be gone, and we at the Weather Service or at the ASU or other places might not even actually ever see it until we go back and then try to figure out what happened. Aircraft are very susceptible to microbursts, and as a result, many U.S. airports, including Sky Harbor, have their own Doppler radar, the sole job to hunt down those elusive storms. We're just getting started on Monsoon Watch 360. Next up, lightning. It can strike in seconds, and some homeowners aren't taking any chances. Wait until you see what they're doing now to prevent the unpredictable. You might enjoy a good summer rain from a monsoon thunderstorm until you find one of these creepy crawlers inside of your home. Coming up, why they'll invade your space and how to keep them out. It is very frustrating to continually see people making bad decisions. Still ahead, advice from a pilot who spends the monsoon saving lives when Monsoon Watch 360 returns. Welcome back to Monsoon Watch 360. Arizona has its share of creepy crawlers, but did you know scorpions, sewer roaches, earwigs, mosquitoes, and black widows become most active during our summer monsoon? One of the first times George Macedon discovered this tiny stinging pest inside his Chandler home, he never saw it coming. One night I'm picking up the book and going to read it and here comes a scorpion out where the book cover is. You could see it coming out and uh, I mean I, I tossed the book and the dog went one direction my wife went the other and Macedon says the encounters only escalated after monsoon thunderstorms brought their signature downpours they'd be on the walls and they'd be down and uh, we'd even find some on the back patio here and and they came with a few friends crickets to small little roaches and things like that so Macedon called for help as we evolve into the latter part of the summer where we start seeing the rains and the monsoon the humidity rises that really kind of peaks the season Steve Greenhall president of Arizona pest prevention says insect spider and scorpion habitats are disrupted by heavy rain as water levels rise these critters look for shelter inside homes invade through any nook or cranny they can find. The first area that we always focus on is right up underneath here, there is a lip. From leaks around the trim at the base of your house, to gaps around doors and windows, cracks along switch plates, vents, and everywhere in between. Areas that are as thin as, in this case, what might be a credit card. Once inside, Greenhall says they'll commonly hang out near plumbing, so kitchens, bathrooms, and laundry rooms are hot spots. How can you keep these unwanted guests out of your home? Greenhall suggests three steps. First, make sure the exterior of your home is free and clear from debris like leaves and firewood. Seal any openings both inside and outside your home. And have a monthly pest spraying service performed. Following this advice, Macedon says he no longer has an infestation. We live in their territory. You just have to be proactive all the time. cars, trucks, an ambulance, and a bus all swept away by flash flooding. Some guy with the uh, tour buses, uh -huh. he tried to make it through with his uh, people and he is now going downstream. If the floodwaters can take down a tour bus like this one last year near Kingman. 911. Yeah, we really, really need a bus situation, ma'am. We need some help. 
that same water can easily stop your car. Quite a shocker, yeah. We come in and we just drizzle a little bit, and then all of a sudden the water kept starting to come from the mountain. This was the scene last July after a big storm in the Superstition sent rushing waters down into Apache Junction. Six people had to be rescued that day, including these two teens. A helicopter lifted them to safety from the treetops near their stranded truck. What a helicopter! What a view! One of them even filmed his own rescue on his cell phone. Then we uh, lifted him up, um, probably about 12 or 15 to 20 foot off the water. And so we cleared the trees and took them over to the side. Officer Russ Dodge had a different vantage point that day. He was inside that chopper. I was at that point in the back seat, the right rear seat, and um, was able to help guide the pilot in. It was a very wild monsoon and a lot of water in an area that, that we haven't seen that much water recently. Dodge has been part of countless rescues. They range from seven-year-old kids to 80-year-old adults and says the endings are often heartbreaking. I don't know that you can ever describe the feelings of seeing the, the recovery of one of these kids. It is a very, very horrible death. Rescuers can't always get to victims if the storms are still rumbling. We've had somewhere we weren't able to get there and we were listening on the radio and listened to the reports of a young boy falling in the water and we can't get there because of weather. We get stuck, we get stranded, we can't go there. And spending the next day looking for the body. Dodge and his crew are ready to go for monsoon 2014, but they hope people will think twice about driving through water. Even though people see these rescues all the time on TV, what do you think it is it's not clicking with them and they still drive through? I think a big part of it is the attitude that it happens to the other person. It'll never happen to me. It is very frustrating to continually see people making bad decisions. His message is a familiar one. Turn around, don't drown. Just because the crossing isn't marked doesn't mean that it's not hazardous. And wait an hour. Most of our flash floods will go away within an hour, hour and a half. And it's not worth risking your life Three to five people die every year in Arizona because of flash flooding. If there's a barricade up and you choose to drive around, you can be cited thanks to Arizona's stupid motorist law. Dust storms are incredibly dangerous, especially if they happen while you're driving. If you get caught in a dust storm, would you know what to do? I can't see. First, check traffic around all sides of your vehicle and begin to slow down. Pull off to the side of the road immediately. Don't wait until you can't see anything to do so. If it's safe enough for you to exit the freeway entirely, then do so. Turn off all your car lights, including your emergency flashers. Set your emergency brake and take your foot off the brake pedal so that your tail lights are not illuminated. Stay in the car with your seatbelt buckled and wait for the storm to pass. Every summer, there are about a half million lightning strikes across Arizona and dozens of homes are hit. And the thing about lightning is you can't see it coming. This is the million dollar view from Nana and Steve Johnson's house near Camelback Mountain. From here, two years ago, they watched an early monsoon storm approach. Like in the movie Storm Chasers, we were just sitting and watching and there were lightning bolts, you know, just all across. It was a light show. As the storm got closer, the couple moved inside. We heard a boom and the lights flickered. Smelling smoke, Mr. Johnson called a neighbor who confirmed the house was on fire. The fire department arrived in minutes. And they started trying to put it out and it was going fast to the attic and it restarted again. They kept a fire truck here till four or five in the morning. Home improvement expert Rosie Romero says one of the things you can do to protect your home from lightning is to add surge protection. If you get a whole house surge protector right where the power enters the house at the service electric station, right. you're actually going to prolong the life of all your electronic equipment as well as protect it from a harmful surge. And the best protection against lightning for your home? Rosie says the tried and true lightning rod. This huge cable goes to the end of the house and we drive a very big, thick 12 foot rod deep into the ground, anchor this, and then anytime these are hit, the surge and all of that energy travels down this cable and straight into the ground, protecting the house completely. As for the Johnsons, their home is as good as new now, but it took more than a year to rebuild. You just want to be back home, yeah. be in your own bed. So let's say a storm is approaching and your phone starts buzzing. Do you know what those watches and warnings actually mean? 
know the difference between a weather watch and a weather warning? Uh, no. Do you know the difference between a watch and a warning? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you think differently if you see a watch versus a warning for the weather in your area? Um, maybe. Not really. <laughs> I guess I just consider them kind of the same. But they're not the same. I would say, uh, I think a, a warning is probably more severe. A warning, I guess, is more urgent. Exactly. So here's what you need to know. A severe thunderstorm warning means a storm with strong winds or large hail is happening right now or is nearby and about to move into your neighborhood. A severe thunderstorm watch is issued further out and means a severe storm is possible and you should pay attention throughout the day. Same when it comes to a dust storm watch. Conditions are right for a dust storm versus a warning. There's a dust storm happening right now. Flash flooding is a biggie. If there's a watch, there probably is a lot of rain in the forecast, enough to cause flooding. If it's a warning, though, flash flooding is happening, and you need to be careful. So pay attention to those watches and warnings you see on 3TV or on your phone. And if you want more information on a specific warning, go to azfamily.com and click on the weather page. We've still got a lot ahead on Monsoon Watch 360. It started as a passion for photography, and we're going to tell you about one Arizonan who has turned the monsoon into a moneymaker. But first, if you want to jump in on the action, we've got a crash course on how to be a storm chaser. We have got the whole valley covered when Monsoon Watch 360 returns. Welcome back to Monsoon Watch 360. During the monsoon, we watch the radar closely, but it's also great to hear from someone who's outside seeing the storm with their own eyes. We love to hear from you when there's weather in your neighborhood, and so does the National Weather Service. But first, they want to make sure you know what you're seeing. It's touching down. Once a funnel cloud does touch the ground, basically it's reclassified as a tornado. Think you know the difference between a tornado and a gustnado? These folks do. But in this case, it's just a shelf cloud. After taking this Saturday morning class, they'll be official storm spotters. It's really educational. It's awesome. Lola Clemens moved from the Midwest to Maricopa and quickly learned she's not in Kansas anymore. We have big old dust storms, and I want my city as well as my family protected. Jay Biggle works outside and figured he'd get certified to report storms since he's caught in so many of them. I was in the dust storm of 2011. I was also in a, the hail storm. It was October, I forget what year that was, but that was pretty major. The class is free and it's offered each spring about a dozen times across the state. So what do you do if you're a storm chaser? Your videos have already gone viral and you've gotten the attention of Hollywood. Well, you get in your car and you drive some more. This is Michael Binsky's time-lapse video of the Great Arizona Haboob of 2011. Shot from the top of a parking garage, this video put him on the storm-chasing map. And when I heard this dust storm coming in, it clicked. I'm like, I should go there and get it coming over downtown because people don't ever see how these dust storms dwarf cities and stuff because they're actually, you know, 4,000 feet tall. And uh, so I just went there and set up and then I couldn't believe you know what I was seeing. And this is Olbinski's time lapse video last year of a giant thunderstorm in Booker, Texas, a so called mothership. But it just turned out to be like an epic looking storm, not just like a supercell, but I mean, it just, it just slowly morphed. So epic, in fact, that with a little Hollywood enhancement, the video made it into the Thor 2 movie. So what's next for this Arizona storm chaser? This season, Olbinski will be streaming live video of his chases and leading a week-long storm chase tour in August. We are going to learn how to take pictures and learn how to time lapse. And Olbinski says from his first chase to those yet to come, the thrill of Mother Nature is overwhelming. We just get in the van and drive and take pictures all day and all night. It's really like an addiction. I mean, it's I can't help it. This year, there's another factor in the monsoon equation, El Nino. El Nino is the periodic warming of ocean waters off the western coast of South America. It affects weather patterns around the world, including right here in the desert southwest. Typically in an El Nino year, we see above average amounts of rain and snow during the winter, but just the opposite in the summer. Take a look at the last five monsoon seasons during El Nino years. The valley usually gets 2.71 inches of rain from the monsoon, but four out of the last five El Nino years brought below average precipitation. 
However, this year, the onset of El Nino is happening much faster than usual. So our forecast this year is actually for more rain than usual in the coming monsoon months. As for temperatures, still pretty toasty. Looks like we'll be above average on those. So remember to make yourself monsoon ready, upgrade your mobile with the 3 TV News app. Plus, azfamily.com will be a constant source of information all season. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And from all of us at 3 TV, have a good night. <laughs>